Yep. Give me a nod yeah, when you're ready. Like four, four, Junior's four, four, ready. Four. Stand by. everyone welcome to this episode of bullets and bourbon i'm here joined with my co-host frank gal and we have a very good friend of mine george dorbert uh a lot of people in the three gun community knows knows george dorbert as that guy who has that big smile you know one of the friendliest guys that you'll meet on the range um <laughs> and i have to say before we even start anything congratulations on your retirement 25 Thanks, years as a firefighter that's that's a huge commitment and you know that's awesome. Um, and, you know, sp like I said, he spent 25 years as a firefighter, the last six years being as a fire investigator, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, and, and, and this is the second firefighter firefighter in a row that we've had on. Sure is. Right. You know, second responders, way better than first responders. <laughs> Tell that to Andy Snyder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we always go back and forth. Yeah, and then I'm going to be competing with the firefighter this weekend, too. Right on, see? Told you. Yeah. No, but, uh, you know, for for those that do know him, know that he's one of the one, one of the friendliest faces and one of the nicest guys and just really good people to be around. So, you know, George, I really do appreciate you coming on here and really listen. Uh, I'm going to enjoy just being here and talking to you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I do appreciate you having me on again. Um, I feel honored because I was on the old Three Gun IQ podcast, and now I'm on Bullets and Bourbon. So I got to do both your shows. So I appreciate that. I appreciate you guys having me on again. Frank, it was very nice meeting you at Matt's retirement ceremony. You had a lot going on, so you probably don't remember me introducing myself. But uh, I just wanted to thank you again for um, taking the time to talk to me there. And uh, I appreciate you guys having me on here. Thank you for the kind words for uh, my retirement there um you know it's great to be back on here with you absolutely yeah i actually do remember uh you you told us that we we're doing good with the podcast yeah. um and i remember listening to your episode back when back when i had aspirations to join the team and i would just listen to 3giq back then uh just to get insight into what was going on in the marine corps shooting team so pretty cool that we've come full circle and that you're on the rebranded show uh but Let's start with the shooting sports. How did you get your start? What discipline did you start in? Um, sorry, my air conditioner's kicking on here. Um, so I started in uh, USPSA. I started a local club. I was punching holes in paper at the local range by myself. And I thought there's gotta be more to this. So I started to do some research online. I found a club pretty close to me that shot USPSA. So I looked into it a little bit and I thought, you know, I'm gonna do this. I went there. They welcomed me with open arms. They said, hey, you know, we, we appreciate all kind of new shooters. So um, they didn't like force me to join or anything right away. They let me shoot a couple matches. And then they said, hey, we're going to start shooting some three gun as well. Um, so I thought, well, you know, that sounds pretty cool. It's definitely three guns, three times the fun. And it kind of evolved from there. And just like anything else, three gun has really taken over. Um, I do love all the other disciplines. Like I like shooting USPSA. I kind of got back into that a little bit again this year. Uh, I wanted to, um, I've got aspirations. I, I like call me crazy, but I thought I want to do whatever I can to train and make the um, world rifle team for the world shoot next year. So I knew that USPSA was a gatekeeper for that. So I got back in the USPSA this year, started shooting some matches again. Um, I've shot 22 PRS, which has helped my long range game for three gun a lot tremendously. Uh, we, we're very fortunate that there is a really awesome gas gun series in this area. Um, we, within a two hour driving distance, I could shoot a match of any flavor every weekend if I wanted to, whether it's three gun or USPSA, gas gun, uh, PRS, 22 PRS, anything like that. So I'm very fortunate in the area that I'm in that I can travel to all these different local clubs and shoot within a two hour uh, time frame there. So very lucky. 
Yeah, being within driving distance of that much variety is pretty great. So, yeah. I mean, USPSA and three gun get compared quite a bit. You could take like your favorite thing about each particular discipline and port it to the other. What would you say that would be? Um, just the camaraderie. Uh, you know, not shooting with a lot of the USPSA folks. You know, everybody says that, hey, USPSA folks are kind of snobby, and I don't see that. Um, I, you know, the folks that I've shot with have have welcomed me with open arms. They know that I'm new to, not new to shooting, but new to USPSA. So they've helped me with stage plans. Uh, they pointed some things out that, you know, you may do in three gun that you're not going to do in USPSA. And, it, you know, I've always shied away from it because the whole DQ thing, you know, everybody dreads that. Nobody wants to go there and get DQ'd right away for something silly. But I haven't seen that, um, you know, even I, I was fortunate enough to go out to Minnesota a couple of weeks ago uh, with my good buddy, Ian Nars, and we went out there for USPSA Multi Gun Nationals. And I wanted to shoot that because, you know, again, I, I thought I need to go out here and do this, get this exposure. And I wanted that to help with um, preparing for like world shoot for next year. And I got to tell you, it was fantastic. Um, Adam Maxwell and the guys, um, Josh Erickson, uh, Spencer Marsh, um, all those guys up there did a fantastic job with creating a welcoming environment um, for being a USPSA multi-gun uh, where I didn't, no one felt like they were walking on eggshells. No one felt like, hey, if we do this wrong, we're going to get de DQ'd or anything. So, you know, that for me was eye-opening. Um, I thought it was fantastic. So I, I'd say that just the camaraderie between the shooting folks in both sports is, is just fantastic. And that's what I really enjoy no matter what I go shoot, what discipline, you know, it's it's hanging out with the folks there and and networking and talking to them and meeting with them. To me, that's like the best thing. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. It's uh, it's definitely the groups of people and the friendships you make. I want to take a step back. Uh, so you you you've spent a career in a profession that doesn't really involve firearms. Uh, when did shooting begin for you? And I guess how has has your career complemented uh your 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 continued your your continued uh, participation in the shooting sports um so that that's a great question um i started when i was five years old my dad gave me a red rider bb gun and we lived in um an, an area that you know was somewhat uh rural so you know i could shoot that bb gun all day long out back um uh, you know, back then you were unsupervised, you know, it wasn't like now you can't go outside and do anything for fear of being kidnapped or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but back then, you know, you could, you could ride your bike and until it was dark and you could take your BB gun with you to your buddy's house way down the, a mile down the street or whatever. And, you know, we shot everything from cans to bottles to whatever we could prop up on a fence post. So I kind of got started with that. And it was, you know, back then it was kind of self-taught. And then my dad got me a 22, um, a little uh, Marlin, um, I think it was a Model 60, if I remember right. Had this little squirrel in the stock. It was a little tube-fed 22 semi-auto. And again, you know, we shot cans, we shot bottles, um, cool stuff like that. Um, just whatever we could find as kids and put up on a fence post or something. And uh, we had plenty of property behind us, so it was never an issue. We didn't have to have a berm or a range or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, you know, I really didn't get in, in, into any, like, real competitive shooting until – Probably like, you know, 2012 is when I went to a three-man, three-gun match, a local uh, three-man, three-gun match in York, PA. And I got two guys that I worked with. I said, hey, let's go try this out. Sounds like fun. Um, they had a blast. We had a good time. We were like second to last. But we <laughs> shot through irons um, in TAC Ops because, you know, there was limited division, but there were only like three, four teams. So we did finish first in limited, but we were like either second or third from the bottom of the list. But, you know, without any um, – uh, optics or anything it definitely made it challenging but i i loved it and i got hooked and i said this is what i want to do all the time um i used to do everything from scuba diving to you know four wheelers dirt bikes whatever and i kind of jumped in with both feet on this and um as a firefighter you work you know shift work so i would plan my vacation time around major matches and luckily my wife was very supportive of it my i have two girls so they really didn't uh, mind um, and I would go to, I'd shoot a major match. Uh, the first major match I ever shot, I shot by myself. I went to Tar Heel, um, back in, I think 2013 or 2014. 
And uh, I met a guy who I'm still friends with today there. We shot together in the same squad and, you know, we text and talk to each other all the time. And um, th th that's how it was. I mean, it, you know, you didn't travel as like a group or anything. I just kind of went on my own and I thought, yeah, this is pretty cool. And I'm going to keep doing this. Very cool. Speaking of traveling, uh, back in like three gun nation days, you used to travel a lot as RO with guys like, you know, Jason Byerly, Bob Osbeck. Right. Um, and you you do a lot of traveling yourself these days. I don't know how much you still right. RO, but um, the U USPSA has that too. They have a traveling RO circuit. You see a lot of the same faces when you go to the area matches at nationals. Uh, do you see that same level of continuity in the RO base uh, as there was during the three gun nation days, or has that kind of waned off? I do. Um, you've got a core dedicated group of guys that are just fantastic here on the East coast. Um, uh, I can't really speak for a lot of West coast matches. The farthest I've been is like Midwest is Missouri, um, and Texas and, uh, now Wisconsin and Minnesota for a couple matches there. I want to get out to like Rocky mountain, uh, superstition mountain, things like that to see what the West coast flavor is like, but you do have a core group of guys that uh, really rock out here on the East coast. You've got Chris Weissman, Pat Parker, uh, Bill Richburg, Adolphus Jones, all those guys that are in that North Carolina, South Carolina area. They're working all the local matches. They're working uh, Tar Heel challenge. They're working uh, battle for the South. They're working fall brawl. Um, they worked all the three gun nation matches back then. And that's where I kind of got my start. And that's how I kind of, those guys kind of took me under their wing and brought me into the fold with them. So when Three Gun Nation was a, a big thing and they had all these regionals, um, I couldn't afford to like shoot the match plus the hotel, plus the fuel, plus the ammo. So you would work the match, you know, cause you got your match fee, um, it, you know, comp for the match. And a lot of times if it was a Three Gun Nation match, they would take care of your hotel for you. Um, the match directors really do a fantastic job with taking care of the ROs because if you've never ROed a major match, it is a major commitment. You most likely are taking a week off of work, almost seven days. Um, you know, you're you're traveling down, so you're paying for all your fuel and all that. So, you know, the match directors take care of the, the guys that staff that match um, with hotels, with uh, comping their their match fees and that. That's fantastic. Uh, a guy who really did a great job with that um, a long time ago was Larry Howe. He, uh, when he ran the F&H match uh, at Peacemaker, that was uh, a fantastic match. Larry always had a separate, like, RO little dinner for the ROs because he knew those guys were committing a week off of work for vacation time. Um, you know, they were away from their families. So these guys that are out there working every match, um, it, you know, I, you can't thank them enough. I make a point to shake every one of their hands to thank them because I've done it. I know how much of a time commitment it is, how hard it is being out there in the sun all day long. They're shooting in um, conditions that are not ideal for them because by the time they're done shooting and the competitors get there on a Thursday or a Friday, if it's a three-day match, you know, most of the targets that are in the woods for shotgun targets, they're kind of like, they have little lanes from where all their, the ROs have shot and they open up these little lanes so you can see those targets. They're not hidden. So those guys kind of, you know, they have it a little tougher than the main competitors. Um, I've never shot a, uh, a, a match as an RO as good as I do as just a competitor. So, uh, you know, I understand and I always try to, you know, help those guys out, uh, thank them as much as I can. If I have like samples of stuff, I always give it to the ROs um, versus like just the main match competitors. Um, and, you know, when you see those guys time after time, it's almost like your family without being blood relatives. Um, you know, Chris Weissman and I are, we've been buddies for a long time. Uh, you know, I, I like to bust Chris the chops because he's a first responder. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, <laughs> he will send me stuff. He, you know, he's like ship stuff to my house and doesn't want me to pay for any. He's given me left-handed mag pouches that he's pulled off of prize tables and everything else. And, uh, you know, you, you get this bond with the RO staff and, you know, those guys really take care of you and uh, make sure that your experience as a paying customer is. Yeah. Are you still doing as much of the traveling RO uh, stuff these no, days? Or, yeah. uh, no, not as much. Um, I like, I will help RO Dean to Turk for the three man, three gun match. Um, that's a two, about a two hour commute for me. Um, I have not got down to help out Jason or, or Donnie Flo or any of those guys in a while. Um, but I do intend to do that now that I've retired and I have some more time. 
Um, I do intend to give back more to the sport and help um, RO some of those major matches um, just because it, you're starting to lose that, um, that experience. You know, a lot of people are, are kind of uh, burning out because they work so many matches. So we need to start pulling a lot of these old guys back in um, to start helping out and, and keep these matches alive and show these new guys what they need to do um, to help out and give back to the sport. Yeah, because – I think there's two ways of looking at ROing. One is like you're an authoritarian, you're there to enforce the rules. But another way to look at it is that you're a mentor. Uh, you're really a coach and you're there to ensure safety. Yeah, but you're also there to, it's a bit of customer service. So having ROed as much as you have all around the country, what's your philosophy on the approach to that position? Um, that's a great question. Um, I would say fairness. It doesn't matter who the competitor is, if it's a new guy who was shooting his first major match, or if it is a major sponsored shooter who's won national championships. Um, as a CRO or an RO, I treated every competitor the same. Um, I didn't give preferential treatment to uh, as a, you know a national champion sponsored shooter over a new shooter. Uh, I felt like every competitor needed the same uh, fair equity on that stage. So that was always my philosophy: was be fair, be can consistent with everybody make sure the calls are the same for everyone um and, and to do my best as someone who's running that that stage because you know you're selling entertainment um if people yeah. do not come back to that match they're spending their money where they want so if they have a bad experience they're not going to come back to that match they're not going to come back and support that match they may not help at that match if they have a good experience they may say hey you know what this was great i'm going to come back and i'm going to work this match next time next year and help that. So for me, you know, uh, I try to be as fair and equitable as I can, no matter who the shooter is. Yeah, that completely makes sense. I, um, so I, I directed my first match this last weekend and we had three, we had three shooters who DQ'd on a stage where it was a rearward movement. And a lot of them tried reloading to their weak side, which no bueno. Right. Um, but I also understood that the way I uh, conveyed that to them, was important to whether or not I, I was very clear. It was like, I hope this doesn't dissuade you from coming back to this match and shooting in general. Um, you're not a bad person. Everyone does it. I did it at my first major match. I paid a lot more money uh, just to, just to get sent home halfway through. So yeah, um, I, I, I agree. It's um, that's why I kind of asked about your philosophy and approach to it. Did um, your first impression with the shooting sports, like your, the ROs and the mentors who kind of like got you in the shooting sports, did that leave a few huge impression on the way you approach ROA? Um, you know, like anything else, I always equated that to what I saw at work with our leadership. You know, you had good ROs and then you had some ROs who you were like, eh. you know, I don't want to say anything bad about anybody, but you knew they set the example of what not to do or how to be. Um, so, you know, you, you kind of, if you saw them again, um, ROing a stage or another match, you kind of knew what to expect from them. So you knew that their 180 line was not going to be like a 180.5 or a 179.5. It was going to be a hard, oh, geez, you're like at 175, stop. And, you know, it's hard to argue that. Um, so you kind of knew who the guys were that were very strict with, um, their 180 rules or any other rules. And you just kind of made sure that you didn't violate that stuff. Um, shoot. Sorry. I kind of lost track of where I was going that, but um, it, you know, you, you know, right away who those individuals are. So they kind of set that impression with you of, all right, when I RO, this is how I don't want to be. And I'm not saying that you are um, relaxed on the rules, but like you said, you handle that approach differently. Um, you convey that to an individual. So I've are, I, I've DQ'd in two major matches, um, two local matches so far. Um, I DQ'd in the Texas Three Gun Championship, um, and you know it was the third day. I was shooting heavy metal, and I came off with this gigantic A frame. Uh, shot the long range steel really well. Came off this big A frame, and I just I don't know if I slipped or what happened, but my finger touched the trigger, and I had an AD my mm -hmm. fault there's nothing i can do about that that's my fault uh, this year i had a pretty good one um my pistol fell out of a brand new holster uh, uh, i did not realize it but my retention screws had backed out when i was traveling to the match 
And and it's my fault because after I thought about it, I remember loosening them up and not tightening them that. back down. Yeah, yeah that was so battle for the it, South. That was that was battle for the South. It was the first match of this year because um, I'm in the Northeast, so you know it's cold in the winter time. You don't shoot a whole lot from January to March. Um, so you, you know if you get good weather, you might get a local match in. But you know what I had to do? I had to put a big old smile on my face. When Buddy Brown came over and said. Hey, bud, you know what this means? I said, buddy, I know exactly what it means. I was already packing my gear up. You know, I'm not going to be the kind of person who argues and tries to fight that and say, you know, the rules say this. I'm not going to range lawyer that. I know I did something wrong. Um, I know what the rules say, and it's it's pretty cut and dry. You can't really argue that. So, I, you know, even when I DQ, I just I take it for what it is. I smile. I learn from that mistake, and I don't make a big show about it because – I don't want to embarrass myself being mm. mad, you, you know, being argumentative or anything like that. So, you know, if, if nothing else, if you do have something like that happen, you know, the best thing you can do is just learn from that mistake and try not to repeat it. I know every time I get on the line and I make ready, I check those screws now. That's for sure. Yeah. That's one of those lessons you only have to learn once. Um, Absolutely. You mentioned it before you, you shoot a lot of different disciplines. You know, you mentioned 22 PRS, um, USPSA, dabble and tactile games, other disciplines. Like, what's your philosophy overall? Uh, are those all contributors to three gun, which is like the most important thing to you, or is it just like you you just want to be good at shooting in different forms uh, that it's presented through competition? Yeah, so I try to take a little bit from every different discipline and equate it somehow to three gun. So. Um, when the tactical games were coming out and everybody was starting to get into that hot and heavy, like 2019, 2020, um, I looked at it as a, a opportunity for me to lose some weight, uh, to get back into fitness because I had some pretty good injuries at work, um, that I had, uh, surgeries from that. And I used that as an excuse. Um, I kept telling myself, Hey, I can't do this. Like, you know, it's too physical, that kind of stuff. So my mindset was, I don't want to push myself and hurt myself. And then finally one day I said, you know what? This tactical game looks too much fun. I'm going to do this. So I set my mind to it. I trained hard. And I actually found that the issues and the pain and the problems that I were having were starting to correct themselves from mm -hmm. the exercise, from the diet, from the weight loss. Um, so I, I, I thought to myself, this is benefiting me in three gun. It's making my footwork faster. It's making me stronger. Um, it's making my cardio better for long jungle run stages and things like that. Uh, the 22 PRS I just happened on a whim. Um, I said, I'm going to try this out. You know, it was kind of during the COVID, height of COVID. Um, the local guys were shooting these 22 matches, and I kind of always kind of just dispelled it as, yeah, it doesn't look very fun. Um, and then I thought, well, heck, that's a cheap way to train for long-distance shooting. Because if you want to make win calls, you mm -hmm. try shooting a 22, tar uh, 22 shot at three to 400 yards, um, you will be humbled very quickly. Um, so you start to learn wind calls and it starts to translate and help you for long range for three gun, for gas gun, for things like that. The same thing with gas gun. I, my local range has a 200 yard range. So I got into the IWI gas gun series because they were shooting at a range that has a 700 yard burn. So we shoot distances from 100 to 650, 635, 650 yards which has really helped me in my three gun long range game, um, which I, I saw at Tar Heel this year because there was a lot of long range, the Tar Heel challenge. Um, and there were a couple stages I was shooting one for one or I'd have one makeup shot with the wind that we had. So the gas gun, the 22 or PRS has really translated into um, improvements for me in three gun and has really helped with three gun shooting. Um, if I could just get my mind right to say, move my chunky fat butt a little faster, then I would be certainly doing a little bit better, but you know, it's always in the back of my mind. Hey, don't tear your Achilles again. I had Achilles surgery, just like you. Yeah. Um, about seven years ago, I fell off a ladder at work. Um, felt pretty good, landed on my feet, tore my left Achilles. So I still have a tear there. And I'm always mindful of that. I'm, I'm very cautious with it, very careful. So I try not to push myself in, even though I can. Um, so I, I certainly understand that um, progression of, you know, crawl, walk, run that you went through when you got back in the USPSA after your surgery. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, so. dude, it sets you back. Uh, is yes. it still, is it still pretty stiff that, that, uh, it like that is, ankle? 
Yeah. Every morning, every evening, every morning I get up, it's like it takes me a couple minutes to get that thing to loosen up. I mm. hobble around, um, especially in the evening when I'm done kind of working in the yard or at work and I, I kind of sit down in my desk at my office or um, if I sit down and watch like a TV show you know, late in the evening when I get up to use the restroom or go to bed, I'm hobbling again because that thing just tightens up throughout yeah. the day when I'm when I'm out moving around and doing stuff. It, it's it's pretty good. Um, I also I, I baby it a lot. I don't run on it. But when I do run, I'm fine, except for two to three days later it's very sore. So yeah. I'm always cautious of that. And I take it easy, like on day one of a major match or, you know, so that way by day two. I'm still competing and I'm not, you know, pushing myself out. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's one of those things that sticks with you. You just learn to manage it, which sounds like you have learned to manage it pretty well. Absolutely. So I'm hoping to get that thing repaired so I can really start to get on the gas here again. Hmm. So you and I, have, we, we've kind of, we, we talk all the time and, and, you know, over the past year, we've talked about the Epsic world rifle shoot in Finland. That's coming up next year. Um, it's something we we're both interested in Um, how are you currently preparing for a match of that caliber and you know what have you heard you know we've we've all kind of heard stuff but what what are the steps necessary to get in a match like that now um great questions um some of the things that i have been doing recently is a lot of homework like I've been doing a lot of match recon from previous world shoots for any videos that I can find on YouTube. Um, there, there's been a lot of um, USA shooters as well as uh, foreign country shooters who are posting their videos just to try to get a flavor of what that match is like. So I knew I know that they're big on like rifle paper at 300 yards or 300 plus yards. And they used a, um, basically a, um, like a USPSA scoring for that or an IPSC scoring. So if you don't shoot alphas, you know, you're down uh, a point, two points, three points, depending upon if you're shooting uh, Charlie's deltas, things like that. So for me, um, right now, uh, the thing that I've been trying to do and prepare for that is more of a mental management type thing of reconning as much video as I can to see what that match is all about or what their stages are like. So that way I can start setting up a training uh, program. Now that I have some more time to hit the range, I can start working on my positional shooting off of barricades, off of kneeling bipods, which, you know, I just did at USPSA Nationals and it did not go well for me off of this lawnmower. Um, You you know, I struggled a little bit as a lefty there because it was kind of angled. So, it, you know, I, I got my uh, second round hit on the uh, target, but I spent a lot of time getting into that position. So now I know that I need to work more with this kneeling bipod because I know a lot of those guys um, in those European countries are big on the kneeling bipods. Um, so if you're going to shoot open, if you're going to shoot uh, modified or the division that allows that, then that's what you have to work on. So for me, long range, um, the, the small, close, quick target transition. I need to work on my eye speed, getting my eyes uh, moving faster from target to target for transitions. Um, And just, you know, that kind of translates from, you know, three gun from USPSA, just the fast trigger finger moving target to target. So that's why I want to kind of shoot those things more to get into position for that. So for me, um, I need to work more on my long range, on my positional shooting off of barricades, off of kneeling bipods and things like that. So I, I'm, I've, uh, my buddy Rick Fox has, has told me that I can go up and shoot at the New Holland Range with him. You know, we can shoot out the 700 yards. I'm definitely going to take him up on those opportunities um, now that I have more time. I have more free time that I'm retired. I'm definitely going to train more during the day. But for me, cardio, movement, just footwork, working on footwork is going to be a big thing. Um, cutting some weight, you, you know, getting faster with my feet so I can move from position to position. There's definitely things that I'm going to work on to uh, help, you know, hopefully promote myself and uh, shoot well enough that I can get a um, an invite to the team there for that. So, you know, to add to the second part of your question there, I kind of got off on a little tangent, but um, USPSA and Outlaw 3-Gun um, are trying to work together. So I know that there are folks who are trying to put the best team that they can um and make the best team they can for this rifle world shoot team uh we definitely want the best shooters that we can get to represent the u.s 
Um, if, if it's not me, I'm not going to be hurt by that. I want the best people going to represent our country because like anything else, I love it when we win in the Olympics. Um, it hurts my feelings when we lose a lot of the winter Olympic sports, um, like some of the skiing and stuff, because it seems like those European countries are so much better than that. And it just drives me nuts. So I want the best team going to win for the U S. Um, so I, if it's not me, I'm going to do whatever I can to support my friends who do make the team. Um, and help them out in any way I can. But uh, USPSA and the Outlaw Free Gun guys are trying to get together and they're trying to make some classifiers or qualifiers uh, to kind of create a standard so that we can gauge and say, hey, these are the best shooters that there are. These are the guys who they, we, we want to represent the U.S. Um, so they did that a little bit. They had a one-stage um, test run at USPSA Multigun Nationals. Um, I know that the Jeff Kirkwald match coming up, I think this month, um, they're going to do again. They're going to have another stage as like a classifier or qualifier stage. Um, Jeremy Gresham and the folks at IWI are going to host a match down at the Clinton house. I know Donnie Flo um, with Tar Heel 3 Gun is, is big involved in that right now. So those guys are working on a, I think an eight or a 10 stage match, two day match. Um, that will be an IPSC style match and it will be a qualifier for the world shoot team. So it's going to be in March and it will help set the team, um, and provide the best shooters to represent the U S I'm, I'm, you know, like they're doing down in South Carolina at, at that, uh, match down there with Donnie Flo. I'm curious if any of the matches out West or even in the Midwest are going to be picking up any, any, any matches. Um, that way there's fair representation across the board. It'd be interesting to kind of see that. I do know that um, Aaron Hayes, um, he's been involved with some of these conversations. So I think you'll see some stuff uh, early on in the year. If they do something at like Texas three gun. Cause if I remember right, that's a March match or an April match. Is that correct? Uh, um, I want to say April. Okay. So, yeah. So, you know, you're really cutting it close in April, but I think that if something isn't done this year, you will see that going forward. I think there's going to be a good collaboration of uh, USPSA and the outlaw three gun guys. Um, the, I don't, you know, I don't want to keep saying outlaw because I don't want to make it sound like we're rebels, but you know, the guys, um, the match directors who set up all these major three gun matches. Um, I think you will see, these classifiers or qualifiers start to be incorporated into like shotgun matches where you will have uh, like an all shotgun match to help select the shotgun world shoot team. Um, USPSA is like a whole different animal because you, you can start to pull uh, pistol shooters from, from that. So you really probably don't need to, to do something different in that aspect for the pistol world shoot team. But I think yeah. you're going to start seeing like different qualifier type matches or stages at matches that will help for the selection of shotgun and the rifle world shoot. Now it'd be interesting to see how things go moving forward because I, I know like us three gun guys were like, well, if USPSA is kind of controlling it, you know, what do we have to kind of qualify for it? And everybody's always given the answer. Well, you know, anybody can go shoot the world shoot. And we right. got that, but not everybody is going to represent Team USA, and I understand right. that as well. And it's like, right. we need something fair and equitable. You know, USPSA, they have the, you know, you you accrue points through shooting the 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 Nationals, USPSA yep. Nationals. And, and IPSC Nationals. IPSC Nationals. Uh, but we don't have a rifle nationals and, and i i understand why like w i understand why we don't have those it's like you know uh, we're we, we're three gunners we're different in a, in that right. regard so it it'd be curious i'm curious to see how things go moving forward um like you said um but kind of you know you you've re represented uh iwi masterpiece arms and vortex and, and other companies as well uh, I kind of want to get your philosophy behind why you decided to represent those co companies because it, you know, everybody's like, I want to be a Jersey shooter. I want to, I want to be sponsored. It's, and, and you especially get that out of young guys because all they look at it as is, well, I don't have to pay for guns or I don't have to do this. But right. what they don't realize is there's a huge commitment behind that. Like, it, 
you have to treat it almost as if it's a second job in many cases. Right. Um, it, you know, Matt, before I answer that, uh, I just wanted to touch on something you just said there. Um, you know, USPSA has really reached out. Um, they're branching out to say, hey, you, you know, they're not saying we want to bring all of three gun in the USPSA. We want you guys to follow our rule set. But they are making an effort to reach out to folks and say, we hear what you're telling us. We hear that, you know, you guys want the best shooters to represent the our, our nation and our country um, at World Shoot. And they are really helping out. They're, they're, you know, everyone's kind of setting egos aside and they are trying to collaborate and come up with a plan on how to get this moving forward. So, uh, you know, I sat and listened uh, Saturday evening at Mauta Gun Nationals. There was a meeting. And I, I really, I got to give it to Ted Murphy, the acting uh, president right now, um, to Nick and, and everybody that was involved there. Um, those guys did fantastic. You know, they, they asked a lot of questions. They took a lot of feedback and, you know, things, um, I don't want to say things got out of hand, but there started to be, uh, you know, not, not confrontation dialogue. type questions. Yeah, the dialogue changed a little bit. And they rolled with it. You know, they didn't get upset. Um, they, you know, they didn't just say, okay, hey, we're done with this. We don't want to hear anything you guys said. They took that feedback and they digested it. And and I say that because I actually had an opportunity to speak to some of those guys on Sunday. And, you know, they listened to what was said. And, you know, they're, they're taking that and they are trying to, to move forward with that. So, um, you know, I think it's a step in the right direction. I think um, we've got the right folks representing the three gun community um, trying to get this ball rolling. And I think that you're going to see, you know, it's a little, little late in the game this year for rifle worlds coming up in next July, I believe um, trying to get a team selected, but I think coming next year, the following year, you're going to really see a big push for shotgun and rifle, um, you know, over the next couple of years. Um, so to get back to your question in reference to like sponsors and things like that, uh, I have been very fortunate. Um, I have most of my sponsors. Uh, I, I don't want to say I have kind of fallen into place with them, um, but I have networked with these individuals who um, lead these companies. Um, Jeremy Gresham, Ruben Alexson, uh, who does the sponsorship stuff with um, Vortex. Uh, a young lady who I, I didn't speak to her ahead of time, so I don't know if she wants me to mention her name, but she worked at a different company that I represented a long time ago. And she remembered me when she was at MPA and she said, you know what? You're a great ambassador um, to the shooting sports and we would love to have you come over and shoot one of our masterpiece on pistols. So I was ecstatic. I thought this is fantastic. Um, but you know, it's not one of those things where you just email them and say, Hey, I want to represent your company. You know, you have to put the legwork in. I know this has been said multiple times, but you just don't email them and say, I want to represent your your brand, your product, your company, because they get so many emails every day from people, like thousands of them, that they just go by the wayside. I hate to say it. Um, but if you are networking, if you are shaking hands with folks, if you are putting yourself out there, if you're RO in these matches, you know, a lot of these sponsors show up to these matches. So they see what kind of individual you are when you're competing. Um, if you have a bad stage and you get mad and you're yelling and you're cussing and things like that, you know, that's not a very good representation of your, your, your personality. It may be, you're just mad for those couple minutes, but it sets a, an impression with them. Um, so you have to be a good ambassador, um, to the shooting sports, to that company, because you are representing their brand, their name. And if you are doing inappropriate things, if you're saying inappropriate things, if you're not representing yourself in a way um that that shows positive light to help new shooters to help the shooting sports you know they're not gonna invest their time in um so i i've been very fortunate um because i have networked with these folks they have brought me on board with their company not because i'm out winning major matches but because they know that i'm out working matches they know that i'm out um helping at trade shows if they need help um, you know, I got lucky with Vortex because I was the sponsor coordinator for a point series match and I reached out to Ruben. Um, uh, we talked at, I think it was a Blue Bridge match. Um, and we talked again at the Lucas Oil PCC championship when I was out in Missouri. And I just started bouncing ideas off of him. I said, 
said, Hey, uh, you know, I said, I know you handle sponsorship at Vortex. Can you give me some tips and tricks and pointers to help out? So we kind of talked back and forth and we just kind of developed a, a relationship. Um, I, I love the Vortex products. I had purchased a lot of Vortex products on my own. And one day I just reached out. I said, Ruben, I said, I'd really love to represent your company. Um, I said, if you ever have a, a slot on your team and you have an opening and you, you need someone, please let me know. And I, you know, a couple months later, I got an email saying, hey, we'd like to have you represent Vortex Optics. And again, I was like, I was ecstatic. And I've been with Vortex now for several years. Um, same thing with Jeremy Gresham. Um, Jeremy reached out to me. We were shooting a, a local match. And he said, hey, he said, uh, have you thought about representing IWI? And I said, you know what? I said, I would love to do that um, because I know how much he gives back to the shooting sports. And I, you know, I would love to represent a company like that but I just had signed on with a rifle company and I didn't think it would be right to turn right around and tell this other rifle company, Hey, sorry, I've got this other offer. I don't want to represent you. And when I told him that he respected that. And he said, when you're ready, you come talk to me. Um, so two, three years later, I reached out to him. And I said, Hey, I said, if you still have a, a slot on your team and you want me to come represent you, I said, I would love to shoot for you. Um, and he said, absolutely. So, um, Again, it was one of those networking things. Jeremy knows that, uh, you know, I give back as much as I can. Um, he, he can call me and, you know, bounce things off of me, or he can call me and say, hey, I need you to drop everything you're doing, book a flight, and come out here and help me at this show, um, So, I, which I've done for him, and I've helped him out. So, it, you know, and I've always made that offer to any of, the, any of the companies I represent that if they ever need help, you know, I'll do whatever I can to give back to them as much as they've given to me. Um, and that's what I think people need to, to remember is this is not a um, just take, take, take relationship. You have to give back. You know, you have to give back as much as you can to that company so that you're a good uh, investment, return investment on that. As well. No, I, that was beautifully said. Um, I, th I think it kind of goes and speaks to your character, too. And, and you're absolutely right. You know, um, it's not just a matter of, oh, I'm this person and I right. can do this. It's it, there has to be some kind of equity that you can offer them. Right. Um, and and, you know, it, it's not I win matches. It, who cares? Like, can you represent us in, in a professional manner? And we've said it over and over yes. and over again. Um, you, you just hit the nail on the head, Matt. You are absolutely 100 percent correct, because I have had the opportunity to hear some inner dialogue and I've seen names thrown around of, Hey, so-and-so is asking the representatives. And then it's like, you, you know, this industry is so small. Um, mm -hmm. If you've made a bad name for yourself, it travels quickly. So mm -hmm. you could be a top level shooter that is winning matches left and right. But if you don't have that character and you don't have that compassion for other people and you don't have that willingness to represent in a good light, they're going to pass you over. I hate to say it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, kind of move, moving along and, you know, you and I spoke about this and I really wanted to respect, um, uh, your wishes with this and, and you gave me the blessing and said, let's talk about it. But, you know, we've all had serious life events go on in our lives and you probably went through one of the biggest scares of yours, um, you know, over the past few years. You were you were diagnosed with prostate cancer. You went through the treatment, and now you're in remission. How has going through that put life in perspective for you? Um, fantastic questions. Um, I so this was kind of it's kind of a two part thing. I actually had bladder cancer. Oh, okay. Um, and so I had bladder cancer five years ago. Uh, you, you know, young forty three year old guy at the time feel like hey. I'm in good shape. There's, I knew there was something wrong, but I kept putting it off. And typical, you know, guy with an EMS type background, fire service background, you, you know, unless the bone's sticking out or you can't control the bleeding, you don't go to the doctors. Mm -hmm. So I had something going on and I kept just putting it off, putting it off. And then I thought, all right, I, I need to get this checked out. And I'm glad I did when I did, because had I waited a little longer, my outcome will be totally different. I may not even be here right now. Um, so I was diagnosed. I, I thought I had a kidney issue. 
And I went to a urologist and they, if, you know, if you don't know, they do what's called a cystoscopy where they take this scope, like a fiber optic scope that I kid you not, is like 18 to 24 inches long. And they insert it um, and they go up through, um, yeah, the front and, um, you know, they check your, your bladder, they check your kidneys and he's looking around and they've got this gigantic monitor and it's like, and I'm looking, I was like, what the heck? I'm seeing my, all my internal stuff. Right. And like, this guy thinks it's cool. He's pointing things out. And I'm like, I don't want to look at this body, you know, just get this over with, you know, I'm gritting my teeth because it is like burning. And he says, man, that's, that's weird. That doesn't look right. And instantly I think, what the heck are you talking about? Like, I don't even see what you're pointing at. So, you know, he tells me, Hey, we're going to, we're going to get you back in here. We're going to get this thing um, like biopsy cut out, check it out. So I was very fortunate. I had a positive um, cancerous tumor in my bladder, but mine was positioned on the inside lining of my bladder. Had it, had I waited, had it progressed and started to get through that lining into the muscle, it would have started to spread to all my other internal organs um, and been a lot worse. Um, so I am actually going in October for my last and final cystoscopy check hopefully as long as everything is clear they say i'm good to go um now i do know that one of my co-workers has had it come back probably four or five times uh, you know he's battling like an esophagus cancer now and everything else um so it, it's for me the mental aspect of this has not going gone away at all um it's something that i think about every day because i think yeah i'm looking forward to that final check um, but I also know it's not a, a matter of if, it's a matter of when this comes back. How's it going to come back? Um, my mother had breast cancer. Um, she fought it for 11 years. Um, and like the last two to three years, she started to, it started to spread all over. Um, so fast forward um, this year, I was, you know, again, something just didn't seem right. I go back to the urologist and I went to get a second opinion. They do an MRI. And the guy says, hey, I see this mass like in your prostate. So I think, shit, that ain't good. You know? So right away, but for me, I had already been through this, um, this mental darkness, I'll say. Um, so I was able to mentally prepare myself better. So when I had this biopsy and I got my results, it wasn't as, it wasn't a, you know, like a thousand pounds being dumped on me at once. Um, you know, when you and I were talking on the phone, I was telling you, and, and this is, um, you know, it's hard to talk about, but, you know, when I got my results, I sat in my truck for 20 minutes and I couldn't even turn the, the start my truck to pull out of the parking lot because I started thinking, you know, right away I was writing my own, you know, my death certificate. So I'm thinking, all right, I've got to get my will updated. I've got to get like a medical power of attorney. Um, you know, I've got to start doing all these things and like, I'm trying to get everything in order and ready to go. So if something happens to me, it's easier on my wife, it's easier on my kids. And then I started to think, geez, you know, I just need, you know, five to eight years. If I can make it five to eight years, I'll be happy because I want to walk my kids down the aisle when they get there. And I got two daughters. So that was like, all right, I need to do that. So that became the whole thing of, you know what? I'm going to start eating better. I'm going to start exercising again, exercising more. Um, and then that kind of pushed me to the tactical games. I thought that's going to be the motivation I need to really kick myself in the butt and get going. Um, so, you know, I, I go into this prostate thing and um, they did like 14 core sample biopsies. And in the meantime, I'm speaking with the urologist, like we're playing phone tag. And finally, I just asked the, the main secretary lady, I said, listen, just tell me what the results are. You know, she said, well, it looks like you got prostate cancer. So I was like, great. Um, so uh, I go, I get the biopsy done. Um, it's like another agonizing week of waiting on the results. And then the, the guy calls me and he says, hey, just want to let you know, it's just a, a benign mass, you're fine. You know, so I went from, hey, you've got prostate cancer to, all right, now you just got a benign mass, everything's good. So I took that as a win and I took that as, all right, that that's pretty cool. It wasn't like like a huge weight lifted off of me because, you know, I had already gone through this once. So I felt like, all right, that that's a win for me. Um, 
I didn't want to gloat about it. I didn't want, you know, because I thought, you know, could have gone the other way and it could still go the other way. So um, it definitely is a, um, it's a mental challenge for sure. Um, something you think about every day, you know, of course, a lot of like, you know, close friends and, and folks that are, you know, are tight with me, they ask me all the time, um, you know, how am I doing, things like that. And I almost feel like, you know, I appreciate them asking, but uh, sometimes I feel like, man, I, you know, I don't want to keep saying, hey, I'm doing fine, you know, because physically I feel like I'm doing fine. But then there's some days where mentally I'm just like worn out, um, you know, thinking about it. So it, it's a challenging thing. It really is. Um, and if you if you have never had a family member experience it, anything like that, or if you've never experienced anything like that, it's uh, it weighs on you hard, really hard. Well, I, I remember I remember last year when you were diagnosed uh, and, and you hit me up about that and just letting me know. Yeah. I mean, I was just one. I was like, what the fuck? Right. And, you know, you, you said you weren't going to change your shooting schedule at all. And, you know, I was thinking, man, I I don't know if I could do that. I, I you know, I do want to be around friends, but I I. I you know, the whole family aspect too, but, you know, you wanted to continue doing things as it was. Uh, and how, how did you make, how did you come to that decision and what prompted you just going with those decisions? You know, it, I will say this, the three gun community and the shooting community as a whole has been fantastic. Um, I enjoy getting out and shooting with folks um, whether it's a monthly basis or it's a, you know, semi-annual basis that I see some of the guys down south at matches and stuff like that. To me, that is like the highlight of that month, that week, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Um, with your military background, with my fire service background, with a lot of people with law enforcement backgrounds, you see a lot of things that people don't see. Um, mm -hmm. You get exposed to things that no one should ever get exposed to. And for me, um, shooting has always helped. Uh, it gets me out of the house. It gets me, um, you know, hanging around other uh, like-minded 2A community people who uh, shoot. Sorry, I'm getting a phone call. Um, and I have no clue who it is, so I'm going to try to see if I can get you. Um, so, it, you know, that has always helped me. Um, it's an escape. Uh, for lack of a better term. Um, can you hear that ringing or no? Nope. Okay, good. Um, I don't know who the heck's calling me. It's one of those like robo spam calls. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, so for me, it's always been an outlet to to relax. Um, and sometimes I think that is my problem is I want to go and have a good time with you, with uh, Weissman, with Ian, with Matt Kitzmiller, with, you know, all these guys that I shoot with all the time um, because it's that escape. And I would rather hang out with people and just pull the trigger. And I, yeah, I want to win, but for me, I get like too relaxed because mm -hmm. I'm there having a good time. Um, I find that I shoot way better if I'm by myself at a match yep. and I don't have my buddies there because then I'm like concentrating on winning. Um, but you know, when everybody else is there, I want to hang out, man. I just want to have a good time. You know, it's that outlet. Um, so for me, that's, that's been the biggest thing. It's been just to help, you know, family mentally to, yeah, exactly. It's, you know, it's a family that you can call any time and, and people will listen to you, whether it's in the middle of the night or, you know, throughout the day. And you don't have to worry about telling them things um, that, you know, that you tell your own family, because I made that mistake. You know, I told my wife something one time, but I just, I couldn't keep it in anymore. And I shared something with her and I wish I never would have, um, you know, to this day, I still can't like sleep right because of it. So, uh, you know, once I told her, I felt better, but I also felt bad because I should have never shared with her what I experienced and uh, had to go through. And, and But other folks in the shooting sports are in their same profession, same job fields. And, you know, they're experiencing similar things, sometimes the same thing. Um, so they know where you're coming from. They know where you're going with that. And, you know, to me, I don't have to say, hey, I'm having a bad day. I can just show up. And when I see you, the first thing we do is hug. Yep. Um, same thing with Chris, same thing with Bob Bowsback, you know, all these guys um, that we see down south at these matches and stuff. Um, you know, I've made some good friends out in the Midwest with with Spencer Marsh and Phil Bob and 
uh, Chris Donahue and, uh, you know, um, uh, Josh Erickson and these guys, you know, those guys are fantastic. Uh, so, it, you know, it's, it's great meeting these new people. And to me, it's, that's the best part of it, you know, whether oh, I DQ or not, uh, you know, if I pull the trigger every stage or if I DQ, I'm still hanging out with all my buddies. I'm yeah. not packing up and going home. So, you know, that happened at Battle for the South. I was the first shooter in the afternoon squads, the first stage. And, you know, I DQ'd and I hung out the rest of the match. I took pictures. I took video for my squad mates. I reset. I picked up poles. You know, I did all that stuff. I helped the ROs. Uh, and I stayed to the end of the match. You know, I didn't just pack up and head home. No, um, yeah, I don't think I, that's the right thing to do. Yeah, I, re I remember seeing you and you came up to me. He's like, dude, I just fucking DQ'd. I was just like, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm just, yeah, yeah, I'm just yeah. like fuck man he's like i'm gonna yeah. be here i was like that's pretty awesome man i mean that you know it it's a it's a commitment itself to come down but right. then even whenever you dq you do have the ability just to to take off and leave and, and you stay right. and you know again that's attributable attributed to the character that you have um and, okay. and you know i i just you know i when i see you it's like george this is awesome we're hanging out like we yeah. hug like at three man three gun you know we show up to the stage and it's like you andy snyder and it's like hell yeah like right like you can't tell which one's andy which one's is, is george you both look the same but it's like hey bring it in <laughs> andy's better looking <laughs> and he flies you know what, a helicopter <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm going to have to start drinking again, Matt, so that way we can start. I start trying this bourbon that you're always talking about. I, we, I had a good time talking to you the other day about bourbon. Uh, uh, it, Frank, you, you were at the uh, preview to this, but Matt and I were talking the other day on the phone. I'm changing the oil in my truck, and we're talking about bourbon and stuff. And, you know, he's telling me about the different brands of bourbon and educating me. And I thought, you know what? I got to try this. I told my wife, I said, hey, I'm going to start trying bourbon. She was, looked at me, and she said, what? She said, you ain't drinking. She said, you have I haven't drank anything in years. Now, all of a sudden, you would start drinking bourbon. I said, yep. I'm Who, who'd drink. you get that idea from? Pops. Matt? Who's Matt? Like, yep, you're yep, such a bad exactly. influence, dude. Oh, yeah. man. I, You know what? Um, I think every wife to all my friends fucking hate me. Because oh, they I, hate you, my, my friend's wives hate me because I'm the guy who, like, gets them buying guns and ammo and just <laughs> like, oh, so you're Frank. I'm like, yeah, that's me. Well, I'm, like, like, I'm, I'm the walking it. I'm the walking ATF here, you know. I mean, I dip. I don't ever try and get anybody else into dipping. But like, whenever it comes to to alcohol, you know, here we go. Like George is wanting to get into some bourbon and everything, which that's great. I I will tell you, don't go to my level to where I probably have sixty to seventy bottles downstairs right now. Mm. <laughs> and, well, I gotta uh, tell you, it, you know, Matt, in conjunction with you, um, I signed up for the Tobin Memorial Hard. Uh, okay. match that's coming up next march um mm -hmm. and you know regrettably i have to withdraw from that because it's the week before the um the if qualifier match is going to be down mm -hmm. at clinton house and i you know financially i'm not going to be able to do back to back because i was going to have to fly to missouri it's like nine almost 10 hours to drive to clinton house for me so uh but you know tobin was a big um like bourbon drinker and yep. You know, if, if you guys haven't looked at that match on practice score, sign up for that. Um, they're going to have two divisions, hard and soft. You know, it's not going to. Um, it's think like now, the old I think blue line gonna... events. Exactly. It's uh, Tobin was big into that. And this match is going to be a charity match for um, a foundation or a charity that he was, you know, is really near and dear to his heart. Um, and, you know, I'm sorry I'm getting off tangent trying to plug these guys. but Oh, uh, no, no, no. Go um, ahead. Yeah, you, you know, Tobin was a good guy. Tobin was a law enforcement officer. Um, Tobin, talk about RO. Tobin was one of those guys who ROed almost every major match that there was. He was that, you know, that guy, his heart was like this big. Uh, everybody loved Tobin. And, you know, when he passed away, it really put a big hole in the three-gun community. Oh, yeah. That um, shocked the three-gun community. Like, yes, people, like, I'll say this, like Tobin always had a way of bringing the community together in one yes. way or another, whether in person and drinking with everybody and getting the party started and hanging out. Yep. And even in death, he brought the whole community together because as soon as that news was passed, 
everybody in the community not just on facebook but we're texting each other yes uh um, you're correct and 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 people were like trying to find out the details people were you know people were going you know making plans to go to the funeral um you know and, and people were like are you going to be able to go it's like i i can't like i i had literally just started a new job and it's like i can't i can't just i i i felt really bad you know but right unfortunately i couldn't make it out there and i i really um, feel bad for his fiance too because they right. were on vacation together i tell you these guys they're they're setting up this match in a unique format and you know hopefully nothing has changed um but what they are doing is they're doing like a hard ass division like that blue line and and the hard ass match that they used to have so the if you sign up for the hard ass you're going to shoot all eight stages thursday um, and these are going to be like five minute part-time stages. So these are not, you know, a quick 30 second burner or bay type stage. This is going to be a, you know, a five minute stage, um, you know, and it's going to kick your ass. Um, but that's what Coven like. And, um, then they're going to have like the main match on Friday and Saturday. And from what I understand and let, and, you know, and, and Todd and these guys, uh, Mark Dacosic and all that, they can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but the last I heard listening to their, um, their live feeds or what they're going to do is they're going to run like a majority of the stages Friday. So you'll shoot, I think like either five or six stages Friday, and then you'll shoot two to three on Saturday. And then Saturday they're having a, um, like a celebration for Tobin. So it's going to be like a, everybody comes in, they have like a dinner, they eat. And from what I understand, it's not going to be a prize table match. Um, but what they are going to do is if things are donated as like prize table type items, they're going to auction them off, I think. And they're going to take those proceeds and, and, and please don't hold me to this, uh, cause I may be speaking out of turn here, but from what I understand, they're going to take those proceeds and they're going to donate them to the charity that Tobin, you know, always supported. And I think Todd was asking people if they're able to, to bring a, a bottle of bourbon, um, you know, to, to share, to, um, um, because Tobin like bourbon and stuff. So, um, and I think they're going to auction off some bottles of bourbon as well. Um, and I may be wrong on that, but, uh, you know, if, if you can get out there, if you're interested in a tactical game style, hard match, sign up for this. There's still some slots open as far as I know. Um, it's going to be the hard, um, shoot everything in one day is going to be like the 29th of February. I think it's a leap year this year. So I think it's 29th. And then March one and two will be the main match days. Um, but uh, yeah, if, you, if you're in that Midwest, area, oh, it's going to be at um, I think the Gadsden Shooting Center. I think it's going to be at yep. Ted Francis's range. Yeah. So you know, if you can, uh, Chad's a great guy. If you can get out there and shoot that match, do it. You know, support a good cause, support a fellow, um, you know, three gun guy who gave back, uh, you know, a hundred percent to the community. No, I appreciate you putting that plug in there. Um, yeah, like that it's unfortunate that this happened but again toby's bringing everybody together yes he is yep so we we've already talked like you did 25 years on the fire service yes sir you're retired now it's been about two weeks you've been into retirement and i often yep. say you know welcome to the rest of your life whenever somebody's retired because it's true this is the rest of your life like guys in the military the in even in your position like we are committed to doing something for as long as we can until we are eligible for retirement and right. you know we're usually used to being told what to do and go here go there all that kind of stuff and so i tell people welcome to the rest of your life because now you are in control of your destiny. What does that look like for you? Um, great question, Matt. Um, so yes, I, you know, over my uh, 25 years in the fire service, I have had opportunities to do some very unique training. Um, I have attended bomb schools. I've attended um, radiation classes out in the um, New Mexico test uh, Nevada test uh, course where they did a lot of the atomic testing. Um, I have been down to um, Alabama um, where they have worked with uh, chemical and biological agents uh, for hazardous material training and stuff like that. So I have had a 
pretty diverse background um, in my first fire service career. I was one of those guys who always wanted to train no matter what it was, um, even to, to the time that I retired, um, you know, like a fire investigator training course opened up and I spent a couple weeks doing that. So that is basically like a fire marshal program where you go in and you're sifting through, you know, burnt rubble looking for an ignition source and things like that. Um, so my last five, six, almost six years, um, I spent doing building inspection, code enforcement, fire marshal duties and stuff like that. And I did that because of the injuries that I was having, um, you know, the problems that I was having with my shoulder, with my, my foot from falling off that ladder and that kind of stuff. I didn't want to hamper, you know, my, my crew, my team, uh, my guys. So I, I thought to myself, rather than being a burden on that, I'm going to kind of move along and allow, you know, another younger guy who's hungry to come up. Um, so in retirement, you know, I, I took one day off and I kind of went right back to it. So I had an opportunity. I got very lucky. Um, I was offered a position to be an instructor for confined space and rope rescue with a company in an industrial um, commercial setting. Um, so I, I thought, my wife told me, she was like, you know, I thought about it. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do this. And she said, listen, she said, you have learned so much. It's time for you to pass on that knowledge that you have. And I agreed with her 100%. So I was actually teaching today. Um, I'll be teaching again tomorrow. But it's on my, my schedule, my terms. I've told these guys, hey, I only want to work like Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I want free time Friday through Monday. And, I, you know, this past weekend, my daughter went back to school. My wife and I were home for the weekend by ourselves. Um, we had crabs one night and then we, we on a whim just jumped in the Jeep and we went to some festival somewhere in Saturday. Um, Sunday, we, we went and had brunch. Um, you know, we just kind of was like lazy days. Hey, what do you want to do? And that's what we did. And it was probably the most relaxing weekend I've ever had in a long, long time. And it was fantastic. and I loved it. And I'm looking forward to a lot more like that. Um, so I got to tell you, retirement's great. If you're on the fence, you know, and you're worried about it, do it. Don't don't worry about it. Just put your paperwork in, retire, and, uh, you know, do something different. Get that spark back and enjoy what you do. Give and share that knowledge that you have, like you're doing, Matt. Um, you know, you're, you're in a position where you're able to mentor and lead younger Marines and teach them what you've, you, you know, you've learned. And that's kind of what I'm doing right now. And to me, um, the pay, it's not about the pay. You know, I got some feedback today um, from one of the owners of the company and he came to me and he said, hey, he said, you know, this last class that you did, uh, he said, I really just kind of poked around to see how things went. And he said, the guys all said the best training they've had in a long time. They said, you were very knowledgeable and we appreciate you coming in here and working for us. And, you know, to me, that was fantastic. I love that. Um, I'd love to do something in the firearms industry um, cause I have that passion there and I have that drive, um, it, you know, and I'm a quick learner, so, um, uh, we'll see how that goes. But, you know, I also, I really enjoy that time, you know, not getting up super early in the morning, uh, five 30 to make sure I'm at work before 7 AM and that kind of stuff. Um, so it's been nice, you know, it's been peaceful. It's been relaxing. It's been a huge, huge weight lifted off of me knowing that, you know, I have that, that pension and that retirement and, uh, I've enjoyed it so far. I like it. Hell yeah. No, I, you know, I, I'm really happy for you. Like whenever, when I got the invite to go up to your retirement party, you know, I was blown away. Um, And, you know, it was half was all your firefighting buddies. And then yeah. the other half, you know, well, we'll break it into thirds. A third was yeah. your firefighting buddies. A third was your family. And then the other third was all your shooting buddies. And it right. was just really cool just to see the interactions and, and, and to meet new people. Well, you know, they wanted to have like a retirement ceremony at work and that kind of stuff. And I thought if I do something like that, I can't bring my family. I can't bring my blood family. I can't bring my shooting friends, family. It's just a logistical nightmare to try to do that. Um, so I thought to myself, you know what? I don't want to do something at work. I want to do something in my house. So my wife said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to just have a good old fashioned cookout at the house. Um, you know, I want my family to come up and, you know, cause I see a lot of my, my family, maybe once a year at Christmas time, my aunt will host a, um, you know, a gathering and we'll all go down there and, you know, you're in your traveling a couple hours to get to see folks. You don't see them all the time. So I've been trying to do 
uh, like a summertime um, get together to bring everybody together at least twice a year. Um, you know, once my mom died, my uncle, my godfather recently passed away uh, from cancer. So I thought to myself, you know what, we got to see each other a lot more than that. So I, uh, I said, I want to, I want to cook out. I want my shooting friends. I want my work friends and I want my family to be here. So you kind of got exposed to a little bit of my crazy family. <laughs> um, it, they're unique sometimes. Um, so, you know, hopefully, uh, they, they behave themselves. Oh yeah. No, it way it, it, uh, wasn't too bad. Um, no, you know, I thought my one wife of the, always, I thought one of the coolest things was it was, I was about to leave and, and I was, I was saying my goodbyes. And then, uh, was it your sister or your niece that came up with, uh, their baby and, and she, First time you said in like a year, she's actually wanted something to do with you. Yeah. And you were able to just stand there and hold her. And you're like, I'm not yeah. going to let go of her until it's like time to let go of her because this, this is the most interaction I, I, of her wanting to come and do something with right. me. Yeah. When she was a baby, man, like if my, my cousin, I, so it's my cousin's daughter. Uh, yeah. He's a first responder. Um, you, you know, his, it's his, well, he's getting ready to have a, him, him and his wife are pregnant again the second time. Uh, so, of course, their first kid, you know, everybody's overprotective of their first kid. So when my uncle passed, I was holding her at the funeral home and I kind of sat down in the chair and I kind of tucked myself away. And I watched as his wife paced back and forth looking for her. Mm-hmm. And I kind of chuckled because, you know, I'm holding her this whole time where she's just being good, just sitting there. And then as she got a little older, you know, we you know, it had been a little while since we've seen each other. And it's like I said, come here, Riley. And she wanted nothing to do with me, man. And that like broke my heart. You know, so her first birthday, we were at her first birthday party. She wouldn't come to me at all. So when she was at the house, it took her a little while to warm up. But as soon as she came to me, I was like, yeah, I'm not letting you go. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Uh, but, George, we've asked you a lot of questions. And, and, you know, I'd like to take the opportunity to turn it over to you to bring up anything you'd like to talk about before we sign off. So, you know, is there anything you'd like to let the listeners know? Yeah, um, I like to, um, I like to know what you and Frank are getting ready, what you're preparing for. Um, I know you have the tactical games team event coming up with uh, Ian Nars. Yep. Um, Ian was a uh, Marine Corps buddy of yours. You guys were in the same unit, uh, like you said. Ian's a firefighter, and Ian's kind of like my new travel partner. You know, we, uh, he'll call me up, or I'll call him up, and I'm, and I'll say, hey, I'm thinking about this match, and he's like, all right, I'm in. You know, so we, we room together, we fly out together, we share rental cars together, and that really helps. Um, so I, I'm kind of jealous that you're partnering up with Ian for this match coming up, but I'm <laughs> looking forward to you guys really rocking out. And I'm going to do everything I can to either get down there either Saturday or Sunday and watch you guys uh, compete. Um, one, because I love the tactical games. Two, because I love watching you guys shoot. And uh, three, because I love the Peacemaker National Training Center. I think it's a fantastic venue. So I think it's going to be cool to have that there. But I'm interested in, you know, what do you and Frank have coming up? Um, any matches that you're shooting soon that hopefully we cross paths again, anything like that? So you know about this week, and we just mentioned. Um, right. Then next month I got another Tactical Games. Uh, okay. It's the individual one down at GTI. Then after that, I'm planning on doing the Fall Brawl. Well, okay. Uh, I'm planning on going out to tactical games nationals and I'm going to finish off with fall brawl. And I have some locals sprinkled in, in between there and everything. Right. Cool. Well, hopefully we cross paths at fall brawl. I'm definitely trying to be at that match. Yep. Uh, Frank, for, you, Frank? for you me, good US- yeah, it's, it's a bunch of USPSA stuff. I got a uh, battle for the North coast in Ohio this weekend, area eight. So I, I think it's up oh, near. Been, yeah. You're not going to be an on. On Alani up there, yep. Yeah, I'm shooting Sunday with the uh, rest of the shooting team. Uh, and then I got Nationals in the beginning of September. And then after that, I um, I need to change gears. I need to find another tactical games to go to, actually. Uh, while you guys were talking, I was looking up flights to uh, Mississippi for the one in February. I'm like... Oh, uh, down at Meridian? Yeah, I was like, why not? Still down it's, there? Been, yeah. it's been iconic for so long. I feel like that's one of the ones that everyone has to yeah, make their way to. So you know, a, friend of my, a friend and I were actually talking about that last night. I don't know if you know Patrick Court. Um, no. He's a three-gun guy from down in North Carolina. He shoots a lot of the Zoo City stuff. Him and I were talking, and he's going to be deploying soon. And uh, 
And so his whole, the rest of his years were washed, but he's like, he's like, I might shoot Meridian. I was like, well, shit, let's just try and go down the Meridian together. And so right. Frank, uh, let, I let, thought let, I was going to have to twist your arm, but fuck it. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's a 13 hour drive. Why not? <laughs> you know, that's cool that, the um, that, that range hosts that tactical games match every year, at the same time. Um, because I know a lot of the tactical games matches have, uh, you know, been hosted at different ranges of uh, different parts of the country but it's cool that it's kind of like yeah. a legacy match at meridian there's some ogs so the one that matt's going to next month gti that's been around for a very long yeah. time that yeah. meridian and i would say like a few of the ranges in texas but that's because that's where they're based out of uh but yeah no those have those have had a lot of staying power and they're um they're linked to the legacy of the games for sure I did uh, I did tactical games at GTI back in twenty one I think, um, and the back they were still calling them battles back then. Are they still calling them battles now? Or are they stages? No, they're stages. stages now. So the um, reactor control room they had like their long course that day was our second battle, and there was a fast rope. Um, so we had an option to look at this fast rope, and I thought, holy crap, that thing is slicker than grease lightning. And I, I decided I was going to take the penalty, the penalty run, um, instead of using this fast rope. What I didn't know was well, there were two fast ropes in there. Uh, and uh, I went to get on the first one. And it's not like the gym rope that, you know, everybody's used to climbing and the rope that they use for the tacking games. This thing was slicker than the cat's ass. Uh, when I grabbed the hold of it before I could get my leg wrapped, I was dropping down like eight feet oh, in this gigantic tube. And it took the skin off of every one of my fingertips. Oh. And I'm looking at my hands like, oh, that's disgusting. You know, because like it's just nothing but meat and dirt and grease yep. all over my fingertips. And right away I'm thinking, all right, what kind of infection am I getting from this? <laughs> but, so, you know, yeah. so I'm like, well, yeah. I, I can't quit. I'm stuck in the middle of this thing. I got to crawl out. And I get out and I get outside and then you have to uh, send – every one of these exterior ladders and they must have 30 of them on this building. And I look over at my wife and she's only been to like three matches to ever watch. And this was the second event. And I'm like holding my fingers up to her and she doesn't understand what I'm doing. And I'm like, yeah, she doesn't know what I'm doing. I got to keep going. I can't quit. So I'm climbing these ladders and I'm thinking, I hope, you know, whoever's behind me doesn't touch any of this uh, blood and oh. pasta and everything else that's coming out of my fingers. And I thought, that's brutal. And I was ready to quit. And I thought, I can't quit on day one. I got to go to day two. And day two, I show up and I look around and there's like eight other guys in the master's <laughs> division that all have their hands wrapped up. And I thought, well, at least I'm not the only one, <laughs> you know, and we gutted it out. And, it, you know, I didn't have a good performance there, uh, but I didn't quit. So for me, that was a win because, you know, that was that was probably one of the, the worst injuries I've ever had while shooting. And uh and I tell you what, if you guys go back to GTI, be careful with the fast ropes there. Get your leg wrapped before you grab a hold of it with your hands. That's for sure. So what you're saying is wear gloves whenever you're inside there. So, you know, what's funny is I had gloves. And since I thought, well, I'm opting out of the rope, I'm not going to take gloves. And uh, I didn't hear them in the stage brief say there's two ropes. Uh, so here's a word of advice for new shooters. Pay attention to the written stage brief. Yeah. One thing, uh, I don't know if you have the time, September 9th, uh, Quantico Shooting Club is hosting a three-gun match. Uh, if you want to come down and shoot that, it's a one-day, starts at 11, finishes at 5. Um, I would definitely love to do that, and I will check my calendar. I know my wife and I have a good bit of traveling come up. The, uh, we're going to be heading out for uh, my daughter's birthday and white coat ceremony. Um for her nursing stuff so we're going to be flying down to charleston for that and then we're going to wilmington for my other daughter's um white coat nursing thing in october um we're traveling to uh memorial free gun match um also in october um and then somewhere in between there we're going to fit my wife's 50th birthday and we're, we're going to go um take a nice vacation for that um, so I will definitely check my calendar. That sounds like it's going to be a blast. Um, I will definitely look into September 9th for that. I'd love to come down and shoot with you guys. 
Um, I always hear you talk about the stages that are put on um, by the Marine Corps shooting team down there and how that match is set up. And uh, I definitely love to come down and shoot that. Heck yeah. Well, George, again, thank you for coming on. Uh, I really enjoy this conversation and I look forward to the next time we get to speak. Yeah. I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, you know, to talk to you and to Frank and, uh, um, you, you know, again, thank you for asking me the questions you did. Thank you for letting me go off on a couple tangents there and, and uh, really promote that, uh, help push that Tobin match. Um, I know that that wasn't something that we talked about, um, but, you, you know, when you we started talking about the bourbon, I thought, man, I got to mention Tobin. <laughs> yeah. You know, that was a guy who embodied the RO um, experience and, you know, giving back to the community. And, you know, to not talk about him would have been a shame. That was, that was a good opportunity. So thank you for letting me, you know, spend a couple minutes talking about him. Absolutely. Well. I appreciate this. And to the listeners, we hope you enjoyed this episode. We hope you're enjoying all the episodes. If you are enjoying everything that we're putting on, please take the time and go ahead and rate and review us uh, on whatever media platform that you use to listen to us. And we look forward to, to talking to you next time. Yes, sir. Thanks, guys. I greatly appreciate it. Yes.